Welcome to Beside the Burn for Wednesday the 31st of January and once again today we are turning to the prophet Isaiah and looking for the hope that we have been finding Sunday by Sunday through this prophet. This week we've been looking at chapters 31, 32 and 33. Uh, Today is chapter 33, uh, just sort of giving us a little introduction to what we looked at on Sunday past in the two chapters, 34 and 35, the wrong way to live and the right way to live. So as we come to chapter 33, we discover that this chapter is all about distress and help the distress of the people who are living apart from God and the help that God then offers them. And we find in the prophet Isaiah, warning after warning after warning. God does not spring his judgment as a surprise on the people. He warns them time and time again that judgment is coming And he gives them the opportunity to repent and to change their ways. And if you flick back through these past few chapters, you'll see that quite a few of them begin with the same word. And chapter 33 is no different. It begins with this word, woe. And you can see it repeated over and over again in this first verse and throughout the chapter, but you'll also see it in some of the preceding chapters as well. Woe is a warning. It is a warning to the people. It is a warning that God is coming. And so the chapter begins with woe to you, destroyer, you who have not been destroyed. Woe to you, betrayer, you who have not been betrayed. When you stop destroying, you will be destroyed. When you stop betraying, you will be betrayed. There is no escape here. It doesn't matter what you have been doing, you will face the consequences of it. But the wonderful thing is that God promises renewal to his people. Once again, we come and we find hope. And what we also find in the second verse of this chapter is a call from the people asking God to be gracious to them. Look at verse 2. Lord, be gracious to us, for we long for you. There's a sense here that the people are coming round. They've heard the warnings and they're turning to God and they're seeking him. And they come asking, be our strength every morning. Our salvation in times of distress. And they are in distress here because God's judgment is coming upon them. So they recognize that they need salvation. And so they're asking God for that salvation. They want him to be gracious to them rather than coming in judgment and wrath. And they are telling God that they are longing for him. That they need him more than anything else. And they need him to be his strength every morning. Wouldn't this be a lovely little prayer, verse 2, to to offer to God whenever we're struggling uh, with our own thoughts and our own words? Just to simply pray that verse 2 and ask God to be gracious and tell him that we're longing for him, that we want him to be our strength and our salvation. And then as we move through the chapter, and obviously I'm not reading every verse, you can follow along in your Bible and read the verses in between. But then as we read through and we come to verses 5 and 6, we discover that God here is promising the salvation that the people are asking for. It is a simple pattern. People ask God for salvation God then offers it to them. The Lord is exalted for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with his justice and righteousness. He will be the sure foundation for our times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. This is what we need 
in today's world. We need a sure foundation for our times. We need something that we can cling on to, that we can be certain of in a world that is so uncertain. And God is promising here to be our salvation, our wisdom and our knowledge. And how do we get that salvation? We fear God. And that is the key to this treasure that he offers us. And what a wonderful treasure it is that in a world of uncertainty, he can be relied upon. Then as we skip ahead to verses 15 and 16, we see the change that happens. Those that have called out for God to be gracious and receive this salvation, those who walk righteously and speak what is right, who reject gain from extortion and keep their hands from accepting bribes, bribes who stop their ears against plots of murder and shut their eyes against contemplating evil, they are the ones who will dwell on the heights, whose refuge will be the mountain fortress. Their bread will be supplied and water will not fail them. If we walk righteously with God and we accept his offer of salvation, then this is the promise that is coming to us, that we will dwell on high, that we will find refuge, that our basic needs will be supplied to us by a gracious God who loves us. And then in verse 17, we see the continuation of that. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty and view a land that stretches afar. Again, could that not be our prayer today, that we would see the beauty of the Lord, that as we go about our lives today, whatever it is we face and come up against, may we see the beauty of the Lord before us. And then again, we're reminded of that salvation at the end in verse 22. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. It is he who will save us. The Lord is our salvation. So take time, read through chapter 33 and just see the progression there of how whenever we call out to God, he meets our needs and he comes to us in salvation. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this promise of salvation. We thank you for the promise that you are the one who will save us. And Lord, we heed your warning of woe and we come asking, Lord, that you would be gracious to us, that you would be our strength this morning and indeed every morning of our lives, that you would be our salvation in times of distress. And we pray, Lord, this day, that we would know the rich store of your salvation and wisdom and knowledge, that you would be the foundation that we build our lives upon. Lord, what a gracious God you are, and we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.